Chapter 10 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 10 Barn Dance. Mr. Burmaster was too distracted to pay heed to Penny and Louise. Brushing past them, he hastened after his wife. Neither of the girls commented on the conversation they had overheard. For a long while, they sat on their horses, gazing in awe at the tumbling water. If ever that dam should go, Penny shuddered. Why, the valley would be flooded in just a few minutes. I doubt folks could be warned in time. It looks as if it could give way any second, too, Louise added uneasily. Why don't we just get out of this valley and stay away? And forget the mystery? A lot of good a mystery will do us if that dam lets go. Penny, we were crazy to come here in the first place. But I want to get a big story for Dad's paper. There's one here. I know not what course others may take, Louise quoted grandly. As for myself, I'm going home on tomorrow's train, rain or shine. We'll both have to go. Penny agreed in a discouraged tone. I had my chance here, but somehow I've muffed it. For a half hour longer, the girls remained at the dam watching the workmen. Presently returning to the Lear cottage, they found Mrs. Lear in the warm kitchen cooking supper. I'm setting the victuals on early tonight, she announced. We ain't got any too much time to get to the frolic at Silas's place. Penny and Louise were not sure that they cared to attend the barn dance. Mrs. Lear, however, was deaf to all excuses. She whisked supper onto the table, and the instant dishes were done, said that she would hitch Trinidad to the buggy. It won't take us long to get there, she encouraged the girls as they reluctantly followed her to the barn. Trinidad's a fast-stepping critter, best hoss in the county for that matter. Soon the ancient buggy was rattling at a brisk clip along the winding woodland road. Mrs. Lear allowed Trinidad to slacken pace as they neared the Burmaster estate. Look at that house, she chortled, waving her buggy whip. Every light in the place lit up. Know why? Mrs. Burmaster's afeard of her shatter. Come dark and she's scared to stick her nose out the door. You don't seem to be afraid of anything. Penny remarked in admiration. Me afeard? The old lady laughed gleefully. What's there to be scared of? Well, perhaps a certain headless horseman. Mrs. Lear hooted. If I was to see that critter a-coming right now, and he had twenty heads, I wouldn't even bat an eye. Horse and buggy approached the giant tulip tree whose gnarled branches were twisted into fantastic shapes. You see that tree? Mrs. Lear demanded. In revolutionary days, a traitor was hanged from that lower limb. Sometimes you can still hear his spirit a sighing and a moaning. You mean the wind whistling through the tree limbs? Penny supplied. Didn't sound like wind to me, Mrs. Lear corrected with a grin. There's some that's afeard to pass under this tree come night but not me the buggy rattled on its top brushing against the overhanging branches of the giant tulip it had grown very dark and the shadows of the woods had a depressing effect upon the girls they were glad to see the lights of the malcolm place on the hill and even more pleased to drive into the yard you gals go right on in mrs lear advised leaping lightly from the buggy i'll look after trinidad the barn dance already was in progress. Crossing the yard, the girls could hear gay laughter above the lively squeak of fiddles. Through the open barn door, they glimpsed a throng of young people whirling in the intricate steps of a square dance. We're certain to be wallflowers at a party such as this, Louise remarked sadly. The girls found themselves a quiet corner from which to watch the merrymakers. However, they were not permitted to remain there. At the end of the first dance, Joe Quigley came to ask Penny for a dance. To Louise's secret joy, he brought along a young man who promptly invited her to be his partner. 
But we don't even know how to square dance, Penny protested. Won't take you long to learn, Joe chuckled, pulling her to her feet. The fiddler broke into a lively tune. Silas Malcolm, acting as caller, shouted boisterous directions to the dancers. Balance all, swing eight, swing em like a swingin' on a gate. Joe Quigley, expert dancer that he was, fairly swept Penny through the intricate formations. Before she hardly was aware of it, the dance was over, and Silas called out, Meet your partner and promenade home. After that, the girls did not lack for partners. The night sped on magic wings. Penny danced many times with Joe and ate supper with him. Then, noticing that the party was starting to break up, she looked about for Mrs. Lear. The old lady was nowhere to be seen, nor could Louise recall having seen her for the past half hour. Somewhat disturbed, they crossed the room to talk to old Silas Malcolm. Mrs. Lear went home a good hour ago, he told them. She said she had to get some sleep, but you gals was having so much fun, she didn't have the heart to take you away. Penny and Louise could not hide their consternation. With Mrs. Lear gone, they would have no way of getting back to the cottage. Don't you worry none, old Silas chuckled. Joe Quickly will come to take you home, and if he don't, there's plenty of young bucks just a-waitin' for the chance. The arrangement was not in the least to the girls' liking. The party, they could see, rapidly was breaking up. Joe Quigley seemed to have disappeared. Nearly all of the girls, except themselves, were supplied with escorts. "'I don't like this, not one little bit,' Penny muttered. "'Let's get out of here, Lou.' "'How will we get back to Mrs. Lear's place?' "'Walk. Without an escort?' "'It's not far.' We'll have to pass the Burmaster place and that horrid tulip tree. Who's afraid of a tulip tree? Penny laughed. Come on, if we don't get away quickly, old Silas will ask some young man to take us home. That would be humiliating. Louise reluctantly followed her chum. The girls obtained their wraps and, without attracting attention, slipped out a side door. Why do you suppose Mrs. Lear slipped off without saying a word? Louise complained as she and Penny walked rapidly along the dark, muddy road. Our shoes will be ruined. So is my ego, Penny added irritably. Joe Quigley certainly let us down, too. He was attentive enough until after supper. Then he simply vanished. The night was very dark, for driving clouds had blotted out the stars. Overhanging trees cast a cavernous gloom upon the twisting hillside road. Louise caught herself shivering. Sternly, she told herself that it came from the cold air rather than nervousness. Presently, the girls approached the Burmaster estate. No lights were burning, but the rambling building loomed up white and ghost-like through the trees. I'll breathe naturally when we're across the bridge, Penny admitted with a laugh. If Mr. Burmaster keeps a guard hidden in the bushes... The fellow might heave a rock at us on general principles. There was no sign of anyone near the estate, yet both Penny and Louise sensed that they were being watched. The unpleasant sensation of uneasiness increased as they drew nearer to the footbridge. Penny, I'm scared, Louise suddenly admitted. Of what? Penny asked with forced cheerfulness. It's too quiet. The half-whispered words died on Louise's lips. Unexpectedly, the stillness of the night was broken by the clatter of hoofbeats. Startled, the girls whirled around. A horse with a rider had plunged through the dense bushes only a short distance behind them. At a hard run, he came straight toward the footbridge. The ghost rider, Louise whispered in terror. She and Penny stood frozen in their tracks. Plainly, they could see the white-robed figure. His lumpy, misshapen hulk seemed rigidly fastened to the horse. Where his head should have been, there was only a nub. End of chapter 10
Chapter 11 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Worth Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adams, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 11 The Headless Horseman. Swift as the wind, the headless horseman approached the narrow bridge. Penny seized Louise's hand, jerking her off the road. The ghost rider thundered past them onto the bridge planks which resounded beneath the steel-shod hooves. Jeepers creepers, Penny whispered. That's no boy prankster this time. It's the real thing. The thunder of hooves had not gone unheard by those within the walls of Sleepy Hollow. Lights flashed on in the house. Two men with lanterns came running from the mill shack. Get him! Get him! screamed a woman's voice from an upstairs window of the house. The clamor did not seem to disturb the goblin rider. At unchanged pace, he clattered across the bridge to its far side. As the two men ran toward him, he suddenly swerved, plunging his horse across a ditch and up a steep bank. There he drew rein for an instant. Rising in his stirrups, he hurled a small, hard object at the two guards. It missed them by inches and fell with a thud on the bridge. Then, with a laugh that resembled no earthly sound, the headless horseman rode through a gap in the bushes and was gone. <laughs> <laughs> Louise and Penny ran to the bridge. Halfway across, they found the object that had been hurled. It was a small, round stone to which had been fastened a piece of paper. Penny picked up the missile. Before she could examine it, Mr. Burmaster came running from the house. He had not taken time to dress, but had thrown a bathrobe over his pajamas. "'You let that fellow get away again!' he shouted angrily to the two workmen. "'Can't you ever stay on the job?' "'Now see here, Mr. Burmaster,' one of the men replied. "'We work eight hours a day and then do guard duty at night.' You can't expect us to stay awake twenty-four hours a day. All right, all right, Mr. Burmaster retorted irritably. Turning toward the bridge, he saw Louise and Penny. Well, so you're here again, he observed, though not in an unfriendly tone. Penny explained that she and Louise had attended the barn dance and were on their way to the Lear cabin. What's that you have in your hand? he interrupted. A stone the headless horseman threw at your workman. There's a paper tied to it. Let's have it, Mr. Burmaster commanded. Penny handed over the stone, though she would have preferred to have examined it herself. Mr. Burmaster cut the string which kept the paper in place. He held it beneath one of the lanterns. Large capital letters cut from newspaper headlines had been pasted in an uneven row across the page. The words spelled a message which read, Kick in handsomely on the Huntley Dam Fund. If you oblige, the galloping ghost will bother you no more. Mr. Burmaster read the message aloud. Crumpling the paper, he stuffed it into the pocket of his robe. There, you see, he cried angrily. It is all a plot to force me to put up money for the Huntley Dam. Who do you think the prankster is? Penny asked. How should I know? Mr. Burmaster stormed. The people of Delta may be behind the scheme, or those hill rats like Silas Malcolm. Then it could be old Lady Lear. Can she ride a horse? Louise interposed. Can that old witch ride? Mr. Burmaster snorted. She was born in a saddle. Has one of the best horses in the valley, too. A jumper. Penny and Louise thought of Trinidad with new respect. Not without misgiving, they recalled that Mrs. Lear had slipped away from the barn dance ahead of them. Wisely, they kept this information to themselves. I'll give a thousand dollars for the capture of that rascal, Mr. Burmaster went on. And if it proves to be Mrs. Lear, I'll add another five hundred. Why not be rid of the ghost in an easier way, Penny suggested. Give that money to the Huntley Dam Fund. Never. I'll not be blackmailed. Besides, the rains are letting up. There's no danger. Penny and Louise did not attempt to argue the matter. The Huntley Dam feud was none of their concern. By the following day, they expected to be far from the valley. There's another person who might be behind this, Mr. Burmaster continued. 
a newspaper editor at Hobostein. He's always hated me, and he's been using his paper to write ugly editorials. I ought to sue him for slander. Though the Headless Horseman episode had excited the girls, they were tired and eager to get to Mrs. Lear's. Accordingly, they cut the conversation short and started on down the road. Mr. Burmester fell into step walking with them as far as the house. "'Come to see us sometime,' he invited with a cordiality that astonished the girls. "'Mrs. Burmaster gets very lonesome. She's nervous, but she means well.' "'I'm sure she does.' Penny responded kindly. She hesitated, then added, I do hope you catch the prankster. Have you considered putting a barricade at the end of the bridge? Can't do it. When we built this place, we had to agree to keep the footbridge open to pedestrians. Suppose you had a movable barrier, Penny suggested. Couldn't your workmen keep watch and swing it into place after the horseman started across the bridge? With one at each end, he'd be trapped. Yeah. That's an idea to be considered, Mr. Burmaster admitted. Only trouble is that my workmen aren't worth their salt as guards, but we'll see. Penny and Louise soon bade the estate owner good night and went on down the road. Once beyond hearing, they discussed the possibility that Mrs. Lear might have masqueraded as the headless horseman. It was queer the way she disappeared from the dance, Penny speculated. Granting that she's a spry old lady, I doubt she'd have it in her to pull off that trick. I'm not so sure, Louise argued. Mr. Burmaster said she was a wonderful rider. Didn't you think that horse tonight looked like Trinidad? Goodness, it was too dark to see. In any case, what about the buggy? Mrs. Lear could have unhitched it somewhere in the woods. Penny shook her head. It doesn't add up somehow. For that matter, nothing about this affair does. Rounding a curve, the girls came within view of the Lear cabin. No light burned, but they took it for granted that Mrs. Lear had gone to bed. Let's give a look-see in the barn, Penny proposed. I want to make sure that our horses are all right. And to see that the buggy's there, too, laughed Louise. They went past the dripping water trough to the barn and opened the doors. Whitefoot nickered. Bones kicked at the stall boards. Penny tossed both horses a few ears of corn and then walked on to Trinidad's stall. It was empty. Nor was there any evidence of a buggy. Well, what do you think of that? Penny commented. Mrs. Lear's not been home. Then maybe Mr. Burmaster's theory is right, Louise exclaimed, staring at the empty stall. Mrs. Lear could have been the one. Listen, commanded Penny. Plainly, the girls could hear a horse and vehicle coming down the road. It was Mrs. Lear, and a moment later she turned into the yard. Penny swung open the barn doors. Trinidad rattled in and pulled up short. His sleek body was covered with sweat, as if he had been driven hard. Mrs. Lear leaped lightly to the barn floor and began to unhitch the horse. "'Well, I'm mighty glad to find you here,' she chirped. "'Joe brought you home, didn't he?' Penny replied that she and Louise had walked. "'You don't say!' the old woman exclaimed. "'I went down the road a piece to see a friend of mine. By the time I got back, the frolic was over. I calculated Joe must have brought you home.' Penny and Louise offered little comment as they helped Mrs. Lear unhitch Trinidad. However, they could see that the old lady was fairly brimming over with suppressed excitement. "'It's late, but I ain't one bit tired.' Mrs. Lear declared as they all entered the house. There's something mighty stimulating about a barn dance. Penny was tempted to remark that her hostess had spent very little time at Silas Malcolm's place. Instead, she remained silent. The girls went at once to bed. Mrs. Lear did not follow them upstairs immediately, but puttered around the kitchen preparing herself a midnight snack. Finally, her step was heard on the stairs. Good night, girls she called cheerfully as she passed their door. Sleep tight. Mrs. Lear entered her own bedroom. Her door squeaked shut. A shoe was heard to thud on the floor, then another. I wish I knew what to think, Penny confided to Louise in a whisper. She's the queerest old lady. Louise had no opportunity to reply, for both girls were startled to hear a shrill cry from the far end of the hall. 
The next instant, their bedroom door burst open. Mrs. Lear, grotesque in old-fashioned flannel nightgown, staggered into the room. Why, what's wrong? Penny asked in astonishment. I've been robbed, Mrs. Lear proclaimed wildly. I've been robbed! End of Chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Hoof Beats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 12 Premonitions. Penny leaped out of bed and touched a match to the wick of an oil lamp. In its flickering yellow glow, Mrs. Lear looked as pale as a ghost. While we were at the barn dance, somebody broke into the house, the old lady explained in an agitated voice. The deed's gone. Now I'll be put off my land like the others. Oh, loss of me, I wished I was dead. What deed do you mean? Penny asked, perplexed. Why, the deed to this house and to my land. I've always kept it under the mattress of my bed, and now it's gone. Isn't the deed recorded? no it ain't i always calculated on having it done but i wanted to save the fee long as i could figured to have the property put in my son's name just before i up and died he's married and living in omaha now see what a mess i'm in if the deed is lost and not recorded you are in difficulties penny agreed oh perhaps it isn't lost said louise encouragingly did you search everywhere, Mrs. Lear? I pulled the bed half to pieces. We'll help you look for it, Penny offered. It must be here somewhere. This is the first time in twenty years that anybody ever stole anything off of me, the old lady wailed as she led the way down the dark hall. But I kind of knowed something like this was going to happen. Mrs. Lear's bedroom was in great disorder blankets had been strewn over the floor and the limp mattress lay doubled up on the springs you see the old lady cried that deed is gone i've looked everywhere penny and louise carefully folded all the blankets they straightened the mattress and searched carefully along the springs they looked beneath the bed the missing paper was not to be found are you sure that maybe you didn't hide it somewhere else penny asked for ten years i kept that deed under the bed mattress the old lady snapped oh it's been stole all right and there's the tracks of the thieving rascal that did it too mrs lear lowered the oil lamp closer to the floor plainly visible were the muddy heel prints of a woman's shoe the marks had left smudges on the rag rugs that dotted the room they crisscrossed the bare floor to the door the window and the bed Penny and Louise followed the trail down the hallway to the stairs. They picked it up again in the kitchen and there lost it. You don't have to follow them tracks no further, Mrs. Lear advised grimly. I know who it was that stole the deed. They ain't nobody could have done it but Mrs. Burmaster. Mrs. Burmaster? Louise echoed, rather stunned by this accusation. She'd move heaven and earth to get me off this here bit of land. She hates me and I hate her. But how could Mrs. Burmaster know you had the deed? Penny asked. You never told her, did you? Oh, seems to me like one in an argument. I did say something about having it here in the house, Mrs. Lear admitted. We was going hot and heavy one day and I don't remember just what I did tell her. Too much, I reckon. The old lady sat down heavily in a chair by the stove. She looked sick and beaten. Don't take it so hard, Penny advised kindly. You can't be sure that Mrs. Burmaster stole the deed. Who else would want it? Some other person might have done it for spite. Mrs. Lear shook her head. As far as I know, I ain't got another enemy in the whole world. Oh, Mrs. Burmaster done it all right. But what can she hope to gain? asked Penny. She aims to put me off this land. Mr. Burmaster seems like a fairly reasonable man. I doubt if he'd make any use of the deed, even if his wife turned it over to him. 
"Maybe not," Mrs. Lear agreed. "But Mrs. Burmaster ain't likely to give it to her husband. She'll find some other way to git at me. You'll see." Nothing Penny or Louise could say cheered the old lady. "Oh, don't you worry about me none," she told them. "I'll brew a cup of tea and take some aspirin, then maybe I can think up a way to git that deed back. I ain't through yet, not by a long shot." Long after Penny and Louise had gone back to bed, the old lady remained in the kitchen. It was nearly three o'clock before they heard her tiptoe upstairs to her room. But at seven the next morning, she was abroad as usual and had breakfast waiting for them. "'I've thought things through,' she told Penny as she poured coffee from a blackened pot. "'It won't do no good to go to Mrs. Burmaster and try to make her give up that deed.' I'll just wait and see what she does first. And in the meantime, the deed may show up, Penny replied. Even though you think Mrs. Burmaster took it, there's always a chance it was misplaced. Foot tracks don't lie, the old lady retorted. I was out looking around early this morning. Them prints lead from my door straight to the Burmaster's. Deeply as the girls were interested in Mrs. Lear's problem, they knew that they could be of no help to her. Already, they had lingered in Red Valley far longer than their original plan. They shuddered to think what their parents would say, if and when they returned to Riverview. Lou, we have to start for Hobostein right away, Penny announced. We'll be lucky if we get there in time to catch a train home. Mrs. Lear urged her young guests to remain another day, but to her kind invitation they turned deaf ears. In vain they pressed money upon her. She refused to accept anything, so Penny was compelled to hide a bill in the teapot, where it could be found later. "'You come again?' the old lady asked, almost plaintively, as she bade them goodbye. "'We'll try to,' Penny promised, mounting bones. "'But if we do, it'll be by train.' "'I got a feeling I ain't going to be here much longer,' Mrs. Lear said sadly. "'Don't worry about the deed,' Penny tried to cheer her. Even if Mrs. Burmaster should have it, she may be afraid to try to make trouble for you. It ain't just that biddy I'm worrying about. It's something deeper. Mrs. Lear's clear gaze swept toward the blue-rimmed hills. Penny and Louise waited for her to go on. After a moment, she did. Seen a rain crow a settin' on the fence this morning. There'll be rain and a lot of it. Maybe the dam will hold, and again maybe it won't shouldn't you move to the hills penny asked anxiously mrs lear's answer was a tight smile hard as granite nothing on earth can move me off this land nothing if the flood takes my house it'll take me with it the old lady extended a bony hand and gravely bade each of the girls goodbye penny and louise rode their horses to the curve of the road and then looked back Mrs. Lear stood by the gate for all the world like a statue of bronze. They waved a fast farewell, but she did not appear to see. Her eyes were raised to the misty hills, and she stood thus until the trees blotted her from view. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of Hoof Beats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 13 Rain. Somehow I can't get old Mrs. Lear out of my mind, Lou. I keep wondering what happened at Red Valley after we left. Penny sprawled on the Davenport of the Parker home, one blue wedge draped over its rolling upholstered arm. Her chum, Louise, had curled herself kitten-fashion in a chair across the room. A full week had now elapsed since the two girls had returned to Riverview from Red Valley. During that time, it had rained nearly every day. Even now, a misty drizzle kept the girls indoors. "'Wonder if it's raining at Red Valley,' Penny mused. "'Why don't you tear that place out of your mind?' Louise demanded, a bit impatiently. We tried to solve the mystery, and we couldn't, so let's forget it. I 
do try, but I can't," Penny sighed. "I keep telling myself Mrs. Lear must be the person who masquerades as the Headless Horseman. Yet I can't completely accept such a theory." "You'll go batty if you keep on." "The worst of it is that everyone laughs at me," Penny complained. "If I so much as mention the Headless Horseman, Dad starts to crack jokes." A step sounded on the porch. Speaking of your father, here he comes now, Louise observed, straightening in her chair. Penny did not bother to undrape herself from the Davenport. Hello, Dad, she greeted her father as he came in. Aren't you home early for lunch? I am about half an hour ahead of schedule, Mr. Parker agreed. He spoke to Louise as he casually dropped an edition of the Riverview Star into his daughter's hands. That town of yours has smashed into print, Penny. What town? Penny's feet came down from the arm of the Davenport, and she seized the paper. Not Red Valley. Red Valley is very much in the news, Mr. Parker replied. These rains are weakening that dam, and some of the experts are becoming alarmed. They're sending someone over to look at it. Oh, Dad, I tried to tell you, Penny cried excitedly. With Louise peering over her shoulder, she spread out the front page of the paper and read the story. Oh, it hardly tells a thing, she complained after she had scanned it. So far, there's not been much to report, Mr. Parker replied. But if the dam should let go, wow, that would be a story. I'm sending my best staff photographer there to get pictures. Penny pricked up her ears. Salt Summers, she demanded. Yes, the star can't take a chance on being scooped by another paper. Speaking of chances, Lou, this is ours, Penny cried. Why don't we go to Red Valley with Salt? Now, just a minute, interrupted Mr. Parker. Salt's going there on business, and he'll have no time for any hocus-pocus. You'll be a bother to him. A bother to Salt? Penny protested indignantly. Why the very idea? Another thing... Mr. Parker resumed. Red Valley isn't considered the safest place in the world just now. While it's unlikely the dam will give way, still the possibility exists. If it should, the break will come without warning and there's apt to be a heavy loss of life. But not mine, said Penny with great confidence. Don't forget that I won three ribbons and a medal this year, and not for being a poor swimmer either. All the same, I shouldn't be too boastful, her father dryly advised. When is Salt leaving? Penny demanded. Any time now, but I'm sure he won't let you tag along. We'll see if we can change his mind, Penny grinned, reaching for the telephone. Disregarding her father's frown, she called the photographer at the star office. Salt was leaving for Red Valley in twenty minutes, and he willingly agreed to take two passengers. There, you see, Penny cried triumphantly, slamming the receiver into its hook. I don't like the idea, Mr. Parker grumbled. Let's hear what Mrs. Weems has to say. The housekeeper, as it developed, had a great deal to say. Penny, however, was equal to all arguments. So eloquently did she plead her case that Mrs. Weems weakened. And you've wanted an old spinning wheel for months, Penny reminded her. While I'm at Red Valley, I'll get one for you. It seems to me I've heard that argument before, Mrs. Weems said dryly. I didn't get a chance to see about it when I was there last time, Penny hastened on. This time I'll make it a point, I promise. I'm pretty sure I can get the one Silas Malcolm has. If you must go, please don't distract Salt with spinning wheels, Mr. Parker said crossly, or headless horseman rot. Remember, he has a job to do. Lou and I will help him, Penny laughed. Just wait and see. In the end, Mr. Parker and Mrs. Weems reluctantly said that Penny might go. Louise obtained permission from her mother to make the trip, and 15 minutes later, the girls were at the star office. As they entered the wire photo room, a loudspeaker blared forth, All right, Riverview, go ahead with your fire picture. Goodness, what was that? Louise exclaimed, startled. Only the wire photo dispatcher talking over the loudspeaker from New York, Penny chuckled. We're about to send a picture out over the network. But how? 
Wait and see, Penny advised. In the center of the room stood two machines with cylinders, one for transmitting pictures to distant stations, the other one for receiving them. On the sending cylinder was wrapped a glossy 8 by 10 photograph of a fire. As Penny spoke, an attendant pressed a starter switch on the sending machine. There was a high-pitched rasp as the clutch threw in, and the cylinder bearing the picture began to turn at a steady, measured pace. It's a complicated process, Penny said glibly. A photoelectric cell scans the picture and transmits it to all the points on the network. Saltier could tell you more about it. Too busy just now, grinned the young photographer. He stood beside a cabinet, stuffing flash bulbs into his coat pocket. It's time we were traveling. Salt grinned in a harassed but friendly way at the girls. He was tall and freckled and not very good looking. Nevertheless, he was the best photographer on the star. I am afraid we took advantage of you in asking for a ride to Red Valley, Penny apologized. Tickled to have you ride along, Salt cut in. He picked up his speed graphic camera and slung a supply case over his shoulder. Well, let's shove off for the wet country. The ride by press car to Delta was far from pleasant. Salt drove too fast. The road was slippery once the auto left the pavement, and ditches brimmed with brown muddy water. At one point they were forced to detour five miles to avoid a bridge that had washed out. Instead of reaching Delta early in the day as they had planned, it was well into the afternoon before they arrived. So where shall I drop you girls? Salt inquired wearily. I'm going to have to work fast if I'm going to get any pictures this afternoon. Drop us anywhere, Penny said. We'll spend the night with Mrs. Lear and go home by train tomorrow. Wonder which way it is to the Huntley Dam. We'll show you the road, Penny offered. It's directly on your way to let us off at the Malcolm Place. I want to stop there to see about a spinning wheel. Guided by the two girls, Salt drove up the winding hillside road to Silas Malcolm's little farm. There, Penny and Louise said goodbye to him and sought to renew acquaintances with the elderly hill man. The old man got up from a porch rocker to greet them cordially. Well, well, I knowed you'd come back one of these days, he chuckled. Thank you mightily for putting them write-ups about Red Valley in the paper. I'm afraid I didn't have much to do with that, Penny said modestly. Red Valley really is a news center these days. We're sitting on a stick of dynamite here, the old man agreed. I'm worried about Mrs. Lear. Me and the wife want her to move up here on the hill where she'd be safe. But not that old gal. She's as stubborn as a mule. And what about the Burmasters? I ain't worrying none about them. They can look after themselves. They're so cocksure there ain't no danger. Then you feel the situation really is serious? Old Silas spat into the grass. When that dam goes, there ain't going to be no written notice sent ahead. The Burmaster place will be taken, and then Mrs. Lear's. After that, the water will sweep down on Delta faster than an express train. From there, it'll spread out over the whole valley. But why don't people move to safety? Down at Delta, plenty of them are pulling up stakes. Old Silas admitted. The Burmasters are sitting tight, though, and so is Mrs. Lear. We were planning on staying with her tonight, Louise contributed uneasily. Oh, reckon you'll be safe enough, Old Silas assured her. Water level ain't been rising none in the last ten hours. But if we have another rain above us, watch out. After chatting a bit longer, Penny broached the matter of the spinning wheel. To her delight, Mr. Malcolm not only offered to sell it for a small sum, but he volunteered to haul it to the railroad station for shipment. The slow, tedious wagon ride down to Delta gave the girls added opportunity to seek information from the old man. Penny deliberately spoke of the headless horseman. Had the mysterious rider been seen or heard of in the valley in recent days? You can't prove it by me, the old man chuckled. I've been so busy getting in my crops I ain't had time for such goings on. Arriving at Delta, Mr. Malcolm drove directly to the railroad station. 
Joe Quigley ought to be around here somewhere, he remarked. See if you can run him down while I unload that spinning wheel. Penny and Louise entered the deserted waiting room of the depot. The door of the little station office was closed, and at first glance they thought that no one was there. Then they saw Joe Quigley standing with his back toward them. He was engrossed in examining something on the floor, an object that was below their field of vision. Hello, Mr. Quigley, Penny sang out. The station agent straightened so suddenly that he bumped his head against the ticket counter. He stared at the girls. Then, as they moved toward the little window, he hastily gathered up whatever he had been examining. Then, as if fearful they would see the object, he crammed it into an open office closet and slammed the door. End of chapter 13「Beats on the Turnpike » by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 14 – A Moving Light "'Well, well,' Joe quickly greeted the girls cordially. "'It's good to see you again. When did you blow into town?' Louise and Penny came close to the ticket window. They were curious as to what the young station agent had hidden in the closet. However, they did not disclose by look or action that they suspected anything was wrong. "'We drove in about an hour ago,' Penny replied carelessly. "'We want to ship a spinning wheel by freight to Riverview.' "'I'd advise you to send it by express,' Quigley said briskly. "'That way you'll have it delivered to your door, and the difference will be trifling.' "'Any way you say,' Penny agreed." Joe went outside with the girls. Silas already was unloading the spinning wheel. He turned it over to the station agent and, after a bit of good-humored joshing, drove away. "'I can get this out for you on the number 73,' Joe promised the girls. "'Come on back to the office while I bill it out.'" Penny and Louise followed the station agent into the little ticket room. Their ears were assailed by the chatter of several telegraph instruments mounted around the edge of a circular work desk. "'How many wires come in here?' Penny asked curiously. Three: The dispatcher's wire, Western Union, and the message wire.' Penny listened attentively to the staccato clatter of one of the wires. "'D-A, D-A,' she said aloud. "'Would that be the Delta station call?' "'It is.' Quigley agreed, giving her a quick look of surprise. He sat down at the circular desk and reached for the telegraph key. After tapping out a swift, brief message, he closed the circuit. Get that? He grinned at Penny. She shook her head ruefully. I learned the Morse code, and that's about all, she confessed. I used to practice on a homemade outfit Dad fixed up for me. Quite a gal, Quigley said admiringly. What can't you do? This was Penny's opportunity, and she seized it. Quite a number of things, she answered. For one, I can't solve a certain mystery that plagues me. Joe Quigley finished making out the waybill. His eyes danced as he handed Penny her receipt. So you admit you've met your Waterloo in our galloping ghost? I admit nothing, Penny retorted. You could help me if you would. How? I'm sure that you know the person who has been causing the Burmaster so much trouble. Trouble? Quigley's eyebrows jerked. The way I look at it, that headless horseman may do him a good turn. He may actually save their worthless necks by driving them out of the valley. Meaning? Meaning that Burmaster can't keep on in his bull-headed fashion without bringing tragedy upon himself as well as the valley. Even now, it's probably too late to reinforce the dam. Then what does your prankster hope to gain? You'll have to ask him. Quigley shrugged. This is the way I look at it. Mrs. Lear and the Burmasters are deep in a feud. The old lady lost a deed to her place, and she figures if she moves off, the Burmaster somehow will take advantage of her. They've made no attempt to do so? Not yet. But old Mrs. Lear is convinced that Mrs. Burmaster is just biding her time. It all sounds rather silly. Maybe it does to an outsider. But this is the serious part. 
If that dam should let go, there'd be no chance to warn either the Burmasters or Mrs. Lear. Both places should be evacuated. Then why isn't it done? Because two stubborn women refuse to listen to reason. Mrs. Burmaster won't budge because she says in no danger. That is just a scheme to get her out of the valley. Mrs. Lear won't leave her home while the Burmasters stay. Then what's to be done? Ask me something easy. The telegraph instrument was chattering the Delta station call again, so quickly turned to answer it. If you see Mrs. Lear before you leave here, try to reason with her, he tossed over his shoulder. I've given up. The girls nodded goodbye and went outside. Silas Malkin's wagon was nowhere to be seen, and after a brief debate, they decided to walk to Mrs. Lear's place. Maybe we can still catch a ride home with salt, Louise remarked dubiously. With all this talk about the dam, I certainly don't relish spending a night in the valley. Oh, Silas said there's no immediate danger unless it rains again, Penny reminded her chum. What Joe Quigley said about Mrs. Lear worries me. We must try to get her to leave the valley. Why not move a mountain? Louise countered. It would be a lot easier. When the girls reached Mrs. Lear's cabin, they discovered that word of their arrival in Delta had traveled ahead of them. Your room's all ready for you, the old lady beamed as she greeted them at the door. This time, I hope you're staying for a week. Nothing seemed to have changed at the Lear cabin. Mrs. Lear had spent the morning canning fruit, and the kitchen table was loaded with containers. Clothes flapped lazily on the line. While waiting for the clothes to dry, the old lady filled in her time by sewing on a rag rug of elaborate pattern. I'm a mite behind in my work, she confessed to her young visitors. These infernal rains set a body back. For three days I couldn't get my washing hung, and I never will get my corn dried lest I do it in the oven. Speaking of rain, Penny began hesitantly, don't you think it's dangerous to remain here much longer? Oh, maybe it is and maybe it ain't, the old lady retorted. Either way, I'm not worrying. They ain't nothing gonna put me off my place, not even a flood. Joe Quigley thinks that both you and the Burmaster should move to a safer place. Then let him go first, Mrs. Lear declared. Didn't Mrs. Burmaster steal a deed to my land just for meanness and spite? If I was dumb enough to leave this place for an hour, she'd find some way to get it away from me. That couldn't be done so easily, smiled Penny. After all, Mr. Burmaster has more sense than his wife. Did you never talk to him about the missing deed? We had words, Mrs. Lear said with emphasis. Of course, he stood up for his wife, said she'd never do such a thing, but I know better. Yet, since the deed disappeared, no one has tried to put you off your land. That's because the Burmasters are waiting their chance. Oh, they're sly and cunning, but I'm just as smart as they are, and they'll never get me off this place. The discussion, Penny felt, was traveling in the same familiar circle. One could not influence Mrs. Lear. Her mind had been made up. Nothing would move her. Thinking that they might at least talk matters over with Mr. Burmaster, the girls presently walked down the road to Sleepy Hollow Estate. A workman who was busy with hammer and saw told them that Mr. and Mrs. Burmaster had motored to Delta for the afternoon. "'What are you building?' Penny inquired curiously. A gate? You might call it that, he grinned. Mr. Burmaster asked me to knock together a couple of them, one for each end of the bridge. Oh, I see. Light dawned upon Penny. Movable barriers to trap the headless horseman prankster. It's a lot of nonsense, if you ask me, the workman grumbled. That feller ain't been around here in a week. Reckon he may never show up again. Yet Mr. Burmaster keeps watch on this bridge? Every night. That wife of his wouldn't give him no peace if he didn't. The workman hammered a nail into place and added, The Burmaster have got something to worry about if only they had the sense to realize it. You mean the Huntley Dam? The workman nodded. I'm quitting here tonight, he confessed. Maybe that dam will hold, but I'm not taking any chances. 
Penny and Louise were even more troubled as they walked back to Mrs. Lear's home. A fine supper awaited them, but they could scarcely do justice to it and found it difficult to respond to the old lady's cheerful conversation. She just doesn't seem to realize that she's in any danger, Louise whispered despairingly to her chum as they did the dishes together. Oh, she knows, Penny replied. But Mrs. Lear is set in her ways. I doubt anyone can induce her to take to the hills. After the dishes had been put away, the girls played card games with the old lady. Promptly at nine o'clock, Mrs. Lear announced that it was bedtime. As she locked up the doors for the night, she stood for a time on the back porch, staring thoughtfully up at the clouds. It looks like rain again, Penny remarked. Mrs. Lear said nothing. She closed the door firmly and turned the key. Once in their bedroom, the girls undressed quickly and blew out the light. For a while, they could hear Mrs. Lear moving about on the bare floor of her own room. Then the house became quiet. "'I'll be glad when we're home again,' Louise whispered, snuggling down under the quilts. "'Think how wet we'd get if that dam should break tonight.' "'Stop talking about it or you'll give me nightmares,' Penny chided. "'Let's go to sleep.' Try as they would, the girls could not settle down. First, Penny would twist and turn, and then Louise would do her share of squirming. Finally, just as they were beginning to feel drowsy, they were startled to hear a drumming sound on the tin roof above their heads. "'What was that?' Louise muttered, sitting up. The sounds were coming faster and faster now. "'Rain!' Penny exclaimed. Jumping out of bed, she went to the window. Already the panes were splashed, and rivulets were chasing one another to the sill. "'If this isn't the worst luck yet,' she muttered. "'It looks like a hard rain, too.' Louise joined her chum at the window. Disheartened, they gazed toward the wood in the hills. Ominous warnings arose in their minds to plague them. With an added burden of water, could the dam hold? Sleep seemed out of the question. Wrapping blankets about themselves, the girls drew chairs to the window and watched. Then, just as suddenly as the rain had started, it ceased. A moon struggled through a jagged gap in the clouds. The woods and barn became discernible once more. "'Rain's over,' Louise said, covering a yawn. "'Let's go to bed, Penny.' Penny gathered up the quilts from the floor, but as she turned away from the window, an object outside the house captured her attention. For an instant, she thought that she was mistaken. Then she gripped Louise's hand, pulling her back to the sill. "'What is it?' Louise asked in bewilderment. "'Look over there,' Penny commanded. From the woods across the road, the girls could see a moving light. Someone with a lantern, Louise said indifferently. Watch, Penny commanded again. Even as she spoke, the lantern was waved in a half circle from side to side. The strange movement was repeated several times. What do you make of it? Louise whispered in awe. I suspect someone is trying to signal this house, Penny replied soberly. Let's keep quiet and see what we can learn. End of chapter 14 Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016 Chapter 15 Into the Woods For several minutes nothing very spectacular happened. At intervals, the strange lantern signals were repeated. It looks to me as if that person over in the woods is trying to signal someone here, Penny said, peering from behind the window curtain. Mrs. Lear? asked Louise. Who else? Certainly no one would have reason to try to attract our attention. But why should anyone come here tonight? As the girls speculated on the meaning of the mysterious signals, they heard a door at the end of the hall softly open. Footsteps padded noiselessly past their door. "'Are you asleep, girls?' Mrs. Lear's voice chirped. Louise would have answered had not Penny clamped a hand firmly over her mouth. After a moment, the footsteps pattered on down the stairway. "'Where can Mrs. Lear be going?' Penny speculated in a whisper. "'She wanted to make certain that we were asleep.' 
The girls did not have long to wait. Soon they heard an outside door close. A moment later they saw the spry old lady crossing the yard to the barn. She was fully dressed and wore a grotesque tight-waisted jacket as protection against the biting night wind. Penny turned her gaze toward the woods once more. The lantern signals had ceased. "'What do you think is going on?' Louise asked in bewilderment. Penny reached for her clothing, which had been left in an untidy heap on the floor. "'I don't know,' she replied grimly. "'With luck, we'll find out.' They dressed as quickly as they could. As Penny was pulling on her shoes, she heard the barn door close. She rushed to the window. Old Lady Lear, riding with an easy grace that belied her years, was walking Trinidad toward the road. "'Now where is she going?' Penny demanded, seizing Louise by the hand. "'Come on, or we'll never learn!' Clattering down the stairs, they reached the yard in time to see Mrs. Lear riding into the woods. "'Know what I think?' Louise asked breathlessly. "'She's the one who's been pulling off these headless horseman stunts.' "'Someone signaled to her from the woods,' Penny reminded her chum. "'She's starting off to meet whoever flashed the lantern.' To attempt to follow the old lady afoot seemed a foolish thing to do. Nevertheless, Penny was convinced that Mrs. Lear would not ride far into the woods. She argued that a golden opportunity would be lost forever if they did not try to learn where she went. "'Then come on if we must do it,' Louise consented. "'It won't be easy to keep her in sight, though.' In their haste, the girls had provided themselves with no light, nor had they imagined that a night could seem so dark. Once among the trees, they had difficulty in keeping to the trail that old Mrs. Lear had chosen. "'Let's turn back,' Louise pleaded. "'We're apt to get lost.' Penny, however, was stubbornly determined to learn the old lady's destination. Though she could not see Trinidad, she could hear the crashing of underbrush only a short distance ahead. "'Penny, I can't keep on.' Louise gasped a moment later. I'm winded. You're scared, Penny amended. Well, so am I, but it's just as easy to go on now as it is to turn back. The trail Mrs. Lear had taken led at a steep angle uphill. The old lady allowed her horse to take his time. Even so, the girls were hard-pressed to keep fairly close. Listen, Penny presently commanded in a whisper. No longer could they hear the sound of Trinidad's hoofbeats. We've lost her, Louise said anxiously. I think Mrs. Lear has stopped, Penny replied, keeping her voice low. Perhaps she heard us and suspects that she was followed. More cautiously than before, the girls moved forward. It was well that they did, for unexpectedly they came to a brook and a clearing. Mrs. Lear had dismounted and tied Trinidad to an elm tree close to the water's edge. Huddling behind a clump of bushes, the girls waited and watched. Mrs. Lear did not appear to be expecting anyone. She gave Trinidad a friendly pat, then, making certain that he was securely fastened to the tree, walked briskly toward the girls. Penny and Louise cringed closer to the ground. The old lady passed them and went on down the trail. You stay here and keep watch of Trinidad, Penny instructed. I'll follow Mrs. Lear. Louise did not want to remain alone. She started to say so, but Penny was gone. The moment her chum had vanished from sight, sheer panic took possession of Louise. An owl hooted. The cry sent icy chills racing down the girl's spine. Tensely, she listened. She was certain she could hear footsteps approaching the brook. Suddenly, she lost all interest in solving the mystery. Her one desire was to get safely out of the woods. Shamelessly, she turned and fled. Penny, doggedly following Mrs. Lear, was startled to hear a crashing of the bushes behind her. As she paused, Louise came running up. "'What is it?' Penny demanded. "'Did someone come for Trinidad?' "'I don't know, and I don't care,' Louise answered grimly. Call me a coward if you like, but I'll not stay by myself. Penny did not chide her chum, though she was disappointed. A moment's thought convinced her that since Louise was unwilling to remain by the brook, it now would be better for them both to trail Mrs. Lear. If they were not to lose her, they must hasten along. 
Where do you think the old lady is going? Louise presently asked as they stumbled over a vine-clogged trail. Not back home. No, Penny agreed in a whisper. We're going in the wrong direction for that. Unexpectedly, the girls emerged into a clearing. Not daring to cross the open space, lest Mrs. Lear see them, they huddled at the fringe of trees. Overhead, dark clouds scudded and boiled. A strengthening wind whipped their clothing about them. Mrs. Lear moved spryly across the open space. Pausing near the edge of a cliff, she crouched beside a huge boulder. Grasping a bush for support, she peered down into the valley. We may be directly above Sleepy Hollow Estate, Penny whispered excitedly. Let's try to get closer and see. Treading cautiously over the sodden leaves, the girls made a wide circle along the edge of trees. Keeping a safe distance from Mrs. Lear, they peered down over the rim of the valley. As Penny had guessed, Sleepy Hollow was to be seen below. A light, dimly visible, burned on the lower floor of the dwelling. They were barely able to discern the long, narrow bridge spanning the mill pond. Now why do you suppose Mrs. Lear came here at this time of night? Louise speculated. Do you think... Penny gave her chum a quick little jab. From far away, she had caught the sound of approaching hoofbeats. The Headless Horseman, Louise whispered in awe. We'll soon see. Mrs. Lear is waiting for something. Minutes elapsed. Penny began to doubt that she had heard an approaching horseman. Then, suddenly, he emerged from a thicket that edged the valley road. The rider was garbed in white, which plainly silhouetted his huge, misshapen body. Where his head should have been, there was nothing. The sight of such an apparition did not seem to dismay old Mrs. Lear. The old lady just leaned further over the cliff, fairly hugging herself with delight. Having gained the road leading to Sleepy Hollow, the horseman came on at a swift pace. Sparks flew from under the steel-shod hooves as they clipped smartly on the stones. Penny's gaze swept ahead of the ghost rider to the bridge. Her heart leaped. Even as the horseman rode on to the structure, workmen sprang from the thickets at either side of the road. High wooden barriers were jerked into place at both ends of the bridge. The headless horseman's retreat was cut off. They've got him, Penny whispered tensely. He's trapped on the bridge. The horse faltered for an instant and slackened speed. Then, as the mysterious rider apparently urged him on, he bore down on the barrier blocking the bridge's exit. He's going to try to jump, Louise murmured. But no one could take such a high barrier. Nervously, the girls watched. By this time, they were certain that the horse was Trinidad. Magnificent though he was, age had crept upon him, and the wooden gate could provide a difficult test even for a train jumper. If Penny and Louise were tense, Mrs. Lear was even more so. Take it, Trinidad, they heard her mutter. Over! Trinidad did not falter. Approaching the barrier at full tilt, he gathered his strength and cleared the structure in a beautiful, clean leap. The startled workman, amazed at the feat, fell back out of the way. Only one made any attempt to stop the rider. The headless horseman plunged his gallant steed through a gap in the trees and was gone. "'You did it, Trinidad!' cackled Mrs. Lear. "'You showed him!' Stooping to pick up a pebble, the old lady hurled it contemptuously toward the bridge. Her aim, though carelessly taken, was surprisingly good. The stone fell with a loud, resounding thud on the bridge planks. Let em wonder where that came from, the old lady chuckled gleefully. Let em wonder. Wrapping her black coat about her, she quickly retreated into the woods. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 16 A Fruitless Search. We'll give Mrs. Lear a little start and then follow, Penny instructed. 
Undoubtedly, she'll return to the brook to meet the Headless Horseman. Then you believe she's been behind the scheme from the first? Louise asked, backing away from the cliff's crumbling edge. Below, on the grounds of Sleepy Hollow, men roved about with lighted lanterns. Apparently no very vigorous effort was being made to pursue the mysterious rider into the woods. Who else besides Mrs. Lear? Penny countered. At least she's been a party to it. But she's not actually the rider. We know that. She certainly knows the identity of the man, Penny said with conviction. And we should too before the night is over. Come on. Fearful lest Mrs. Lear get too much of a start, the girls set off in pursuit. However, they had not gone far before they realized that the old lady was not returning to the brook. Instead, she seemed to be heading for home. We didn't figure this so well after all, Penny observed in deep disgust. Now it's too late to go back to the brook, so we've lost our chance to learn who the fellow is. Maybe not, Louise said cheerfully. Someone will have to bring Trinidad home. They had now reached the main road with Mrs. Lear's cabin visible over the hill. Not once, glancing over her shoulder, the old lady trod a muddy path to her own gate. Once inside the grounds, she peered up at the windows of the bedroom Penny and Louise had occupied. Satisfied that no light was burning, she quietly entered the house. The two girls waited for a while in the woods. They thought it wise to give the old lady ample time to go to bed and fall asleep. Come on, I think we've waited long enough, Penny said at last. They crossed the road and stole to the front door. To their astonishment, it was locked. The back door also was fastened from the inside. We'll have to try a window, Penny proposed. The windows also were locked, or so stuck by dampness that they could not be budged. If this isn't a pretty mess, Penny exclaimed impatiently. Mrs. Lear never used to lock anything. She must have started doing it since the deed to her property disappeared. What are we going to do, sleep in the barn? That might not be such a bad idea. Then, if Trinidad ever does come home, we'll be able to see who rode him. You'll have to get another idea, Louise retorted. That old barn has rats and mice. I wouldn't sleep there for a million dollars. Penny circled the house, searching for a way out of the difficulty. She could find no ladder. A rose trellis rising along the front wall suggested that if they could use it to reach the second story, they might creep along the porch roof to their own room. There, at least, the window had been left unlocked. It looks flimsy, Penny said, testing the structure. I'll try it first. Gingerly, she climbed the trellis, trying to avoid the thorns of a withered rose plant. She reached the porch roof and skillfully rolled onto it. From there, she motioned for her chum to follow. Louise was heavier than Penny and less adept at climbing. The rose bush tore at her clothing and wounded her arms. Just as she was reaching for Penny's outstretched hand, one of the cross pieces gave way. Startled, Louise let out a scream of terror. Now you've done it, Penny muttered, pulling her by brute force onto the porch. Mrs. Lear's deaf if she didn't hear that. Tiptoeing with frantic haste across the porch roof, they tested the window of their bedroom. It raised easily, but as they scrambled over the sill, the girls were dismayed to hear Mrs. Lear's door open farther down the hall. She heard us, Louise whispered tensely. Now what'll we do? Into bed and cover up, Penny ordered. Not even taking time to remove their shoes, they made a dive for the big four-poster bed. Scarcely had they pulled up the coverlet to their ears when they heard Mrs. Lear just outside the door. Are you all right? she asked anxiously. I thought I heard a scream. The girls did not answer. They closed their eyes and pretended to be asleep. Mrs. Lear opened the door and peeped inside. Not entirely satisfied, she crossed the room and stood for a moment at the open window. Closing it halfway, she then tiptoed out the door. Was that a close call? Penny whispered, sitting up in bed. Lucky for us, she didn't notice anything wrong. Waiting a few minutes longer, the girl slid from beneath the covers and quickly undressed. 
At least we learned one important thing tonight, Penny observed, quietly lowering a shoe to the floor. Mrs. Lear is behind this headless horseman escapade. But who is the fellow? Silas Malcolm, perhaps, only he's a bit too old for pranks. Penny did not answer. Moving to the window, she gazed thoughtfully toward the barn. Someone may bring Trinidad back, she commented. By watching, not for me, Louise cut in. She rolled back into bed. I'm going to get myself a little shut-eye before dawn. Penny drew a chair up to the window. The room was cold. Her chair was straight-backed and hard. Minutes dragged by, and still Trinidad did not put in an appearance. The horse may not even come back tonight, Penny thought, covering a yawn. Guess I'll jump into bed. I can hear just as well from there. She snuggled in beside Louise and enjoyed the warmth of the covers. A delightful drowsiness took possession of her. Though she struggled to stay awake, her eyelids became heavier and heavier. Presently, Penny slept. She slept soundly. When she awakened, the first rays of morning light were seeping in through the window. But it was not the sun that had aroused her from slumber. As she stirred drowsily, she became aware of an unusual sound. At first, she could not place it. Then she realized that someone was pounding on the downstairs screen door. Penny nudged Louise. When that did not arouse her, she gave her a vigorous shake. What now? Louise mumbled crossly. Wake up! Someone's downstairs pounding on the screen door. Let them pound. Louise rolled away from her chum's grasp and tried to go back to sleep. The thumping noise was repeated, louder and more insistent. Penny was sure she heard the rumble of many voices. Thoroughly puzzled, she swung out of bed and reached for a robe. Open up! called a man's voice from below. Penny ran to the window. The porch roof half obstructed her view, but in the yard she could see at least half a dozen men. Others were at the door, hammering to be let in. By this time, the thumpings had thoroughly awakened Louise. She, too, deserted the bed and went to the window. Something's wrong, she exclaimed. Just see that mob of men. I'll warrant they're here to make trouble for Mrs. Lear. Perhaps because of what happened last night. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 17 Accusations Penny and Louise scrambled into their clothes. As they pulled on their shoes, they heard Mrs. Lear going down the hall. Fearful lest she encounter trouble, they hastened to overtake her before she reached the front door. Do you think it's safe to let those men in? Penny ventured dubiously. Why shouldn't I open the door? Mrs. Lear demanded. I've nothing to hide. She gazed sharply at Penny, who suddenly was at a loss for words. Mrs. Lear swung wide the door to face the group of men on the porch. Joe Quigley was there, and so was Silas Malcolm. Seeing friends, Penny and Louise felt reassured. Well, demanded Mrs. Lear, though not in an unfriendly tone, what's the meaning of waking a body up in the middle of the night? Word just came by radio. Joe Quigley spoke up. There's been a big rain over Goshen Way. I could have told you that last night. Mrs. Lear replied, undisturbed. Knew it when I seen them big clouds a bilin' up. You ought to get out of here right away, added Silas Malcolm. That damn at Huntley Lake ain't safe no more. And when all that water comes down from Goshen, it ain't too likely she'll hold. Are the people of Delta leaving for the hills? Mrs. Lear asked coldly. Some are, Quigley assured her. We're urging everyone who can to take the morning train. A few stubborn ones like yourself refuse to budge. Oh, so I'm stubborn. I suppose you're leaving, Joe Quigley? That's different. I have a job to do, and I can't desert my post at the depot. And the Burmasters, are they leaving? We're on our way up to the estate now to warn them. I'll make you a bargain. 
Mrs. Lear agreed, a hard glint in her eye. If Mrs. Burmaster goes, then I'll go too. But so long as she stays in this valley, I'm not stirring a one inch. You're both as stubborn as one of Silas's mules, Joe Quigley said impatiently. Don't you realize that your life is in danger? When you've lived as long as I have, young man, life ain't as precious as some other things. If you won't listen to reason, what about these girls? Quigley turned toward Penny and Louise. Mrs. Lear's face became troubled. Oh, they'll have to go at once, she decided. What time is that train out of Delta? 11.40, Joe Quigley replied. Or they can catch it at Witch Falls at 11. Getting on at that station, they might find seats. We'll pack our things right away, Louise promised, starting for the stairs. Penny followed reluctantly. Though she realized it would be foolhardy to remain, she did not want to leave Red Valley. Particularly, she disliked to desert old Mrs. Lear. If Mrs. Lear is determined to stay here, what can we do about it? Louise argued reasonably. You know our folks wouldn't want us to remain. The girls quickly gathered their belongings together and went downstairs again. To their surprise, Mrs. Lear had put on her coat and was preparing to accompany the men to Sleepy Hollow. Now, I ain't leaving for good, she announced, observing Penny's astonished gaze. Leastwise, not until the Burmasters do. I'm going there now to see what they've got to say. Come along if you like, one of the men invited the girls. Maybe you can help persuade them to leave the valley. Penny and Louise doubted that they would be of any assistance whatsoever. However, it was several hours before train time, so they were very glad indeed to ride in one of the cars to Sleepy Hollow Estate. At the crossroad, Joe Quigley turned back to Delta, for he was scheduled to go on duty at the railroad station. The others kept on until they reached the estate. Silas Malcolm rapped sharply on the front door. In a moment, a light went on in an upstairs room. A few minutes later, a window opened and Mr. Burmaster, clad in pajamas, peered down. "'What's wanted?' he demanded angrily. "'There's been a big rain above us,' he was told. "'Everyone's being advised to get out while there's time.' Mr. Burmaster was silent for a moment. Then he said, "'Wait a minute until I dress. We'll talk about it.' Ten minutes elapsed before the estate owner opened the front door and bade the group enter. He led the party into a luxuriously furnished living room. Now, what is this all about? Mr. Burmaster asked. We had one disturbance here last night, and it seems to me that's about enough. Silas Malcolm explained the situation, speaking quietly but with force. And who's to say the dam won't hold? Mr. Burmaster interrupted. Well, it's the opinion of them that's been working on it for the past two weeks. If we had money and enough health, so that's why you rooted me out of bed. We came here to do you a favor, one of the men retorted angrily. It's too late to save the dam now, lest nature sees fit to spare her. But it ain't too late for you and your household to get out of here. I have two hundred thousand dollars sunk into this place. That's a heap of money, Silas said thoughtfully. But it ain't going to mean anything to you if that dam lets go. You ought to leave here without a waitin'. Ah, oh, perhaps you're right, Mr. Burmaster said, pacing back and forth in front of the fireplace. It was my judgment that the dam would hold. Naturally, no one could predict these heavy, unseasonable rains. A door opened. Everyone turned to see Mrs. Burmaster on the threshold. Her hair was uncombed, and she wore a brilliant red house coat. Who are these people? she asked her husband in a cold voice. Villagers, they've come to warn us that we ought to leave here. Warn us indeed, Mrs. Burmaster retorted bitterly. I don't know what they've said to you, but it's just another scheme to try to get us away from here. Haven't they tried everything? This ain't no headless horseman scare, ma'am, spoke Silas Malcolm. The Huntley Dam is likely to give away at any minute. I've heard that for weeks, Mrs. Burmaster's gaze was scornful. Oh, I know you've hated us ever since we built this house. You've tried every imaginable trick to make us leave. That ain't true, ma'am, Silas replied soberly. Mrs. Burmaster's angry gaze swept the group and came to rest on Mrs. Lear. 
That old witch who lives down the road has set you all against me, she fairly screamed. She's lied and fought me at every turn. Mrs. Lear detached herself from the group. She spoke quietly, but with suppressed fury. I've stood a lot from you in the past, Mrs. Burmaster, she retorted. But there ain't no one alive that can call me a witch. Oh, I can't, Mrs. Burmaster mocked. Well, you're worse than an old witch. At least I ain't a sneak thief. I don't go breaking into folks' houses to steal the deed to their property. How dare you accuse me of such a thing? Because I know you got the deed to my cabin right here in this house, Mrs. Lear accused. You got it hid away. That's a lie. Ladies, ladies, remonstrated one of the men from the village. Mrs. Lear paid not the slightest heed. Advancing towards Mrs. Burmaster, she waved a bony finger at her. So it's a lie, is it? she cackled. Well, let me tell you this. Mary Gibson, that worked here as a maid until last Wednesday, saw that deed of mine in your bureau drawer. She told me herself. How dare you say such a thing, gasped Mrs. Burmaster. Mr. Burmaster stepped between his wife and Mrs. Lear. Enough of this, he said firmly. We know nothing about the deed to your property, Mrs. Lear. Then you prove it ain't here, the old lady challenged. Look in your wife's bureau and see. Certainly. Since you have made such an accusation, we shall by all means disprove it. As Mr. Burmaster started toward the circular stairway, his wife caught nervously at his arm. No, John, don't, don't be so weak as to give in to her. Mrs. Lear has made a very serious accusation against you. We must prove to all these people that she misjudged you. You you can't search. You mustn't. It's it's insulting to me. But, my dear, I'll never speak to you again if you do. Never. Mr. Burmaster hesitated, not knowing what to do. So you're afraid to look, Mrs. Lear needled him. No, I'm not afraid, the estate owner said with sudden decision. Furthermore, I want someone to accompany me as witness. His gaze swept the little group and singled out Penny. Will you come? Penny did not wish to be drawn into the feud, but as the others urged her to accompany Mr. Burmaster, she reluctantly agreed. Mrs. Burmaster's bedroom was a luxurious chamber directly above the living room. There was a canopied bed with beautiful hangings and a dressing table that fairly took Penny's breath away. There's the bureau, said Mr. Burmaster, pointing to another massive piece of furniture. Suppose you search. Rather reluctantly, Penny opened the top drawer. It was filled with lace handkerchiefs and neat boxes of stockings. The second drawer contained silk lingerie, while the third was filled with odds and ends. So it's not there, Mr. Burmaster exclaimed in relief as Penny straightened from her task. I was sure it wouldn't be. From the tone of his voice, it was evident that he had been very much afraid the deed would be found. Penny's eyes wandered toward the dressing table. Ah, oh, you may as well search there, too, Mr. Burmaster said. Then there can be no further accusations. One by one, Penny opened the drawers of the dressing table. Mrs. Burmaster's jewel box caught her eye. It was filled to overflowing with bracelets, pins, and valuable necklaces. Just behind the big silver box, another object drew her attention. At a glance, she knew that it was a legal document. As she picked it up, she saw that it was the deed to Mrs. Lear's property. What's that? Mr. Burmaster demanded sharply when Penny did not speak. Without answering, she gave him the document. It is the deed, he exclaimed, dumbfounded. Then my wife did steal it from Mrs. Lear, but why? Why would she do such a thing? I'm sure she didn't realize. Mrs. Burmaster is a sick woman, a very sick woman, the estate owner said unhappily. But what must I do? What can you do except go downstairs and tell the truth? Face them all? Admit that my wife is a thief? It seems to me that the only honorable thing is to return the deed to Mrs. Lear. Well, the deed must be returned, Mr. Burmaster acknowledged, but not today later i realize that you wish to protect your wife penny said quietly it's natural but mrs lear has to be considered 
I'll pay you handsomely to keep quiet about this, Mr. Burmaster said. Furthermore, I, I promise I'll return the deed to Mrs. Lear tomorrow. Penny shook her head. Very well, then, Mr. Burmaster sighed. I suppose I must face them. I don't mind for myself. It's my wife I'm worried about. She's apt to go into hysterics. Tramping down the stairs, the estate owner confronted the little group of villagers. In a few words, he acknowledged that the deed had been found, apologized to Mrs. Lear, and placed the document in her hands. Throughout the speech, Mrs. Burmaster stood as one stricken. Her face flushed as red as the robe she wore, then became deathly white. I thank you, Mr. Burmaster. You are an honorable man, Mrs. Lear said stiffly. I feel mighty sorry for the way things turned out, and maybe... Oh, yes, everyone can see how sorry you are, Mrs. Burmaster broke in shrilly. You're a hateful, scheming old hag. Now get out of my house. Get out, all of you, all of you. Never come back. About the dam, Silas Malcolm started to say. The dam, Mrs. Burmaster screamed. Let it break. I wish it would. Then I'd never see any of you again. Go on, get out. Do you hear me? Get out. The little group retreated toward the door. Mrs. Burmaster did not wait to see the villagers leave. Weeping hysterically, she ran from the room. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016 Chapter 18 Blood Waters Rain splattered steadily against the car windows as the noon passenger train pulled from the Witch Falls station. Penny and Louise watched the plump drops join into fat rivulets which raced one another to the sill. Since saying goodbye to Mrs. Lear, Silas Malcolm, and their other valley friends, they had not done much talking. They felt too discouraged. I wish we had decided to catch the train at Delta, Penny remarked, settling herself for the long ride home. Then we could have said goodbye to Joe Quigley. We'll be passing through the station soon. Louise nodded morosely. Things certainly ended in one grand mess, she commented. Mrs. Lear got the deed to her property back, but the feud will be worse than ever now. Furthermore, we never did solve the Headless Horseman mystery. Not that it matters. Reaching for a discarded newspaper which lay on the coach seat, Penny shot her chum a quick, knowing look. Just what does that mean? Louise demanded alertly. Penny pretended not to understand. You just gave me one of those wise owl looks, Louise accused, just as if you had solved the mystery. I assure you I haven't, and never will now that we're leaving the valley. But you do have an idea who was behind the scheme. Mrs. Lear, of course. We saw that much with our own eyes. But we didn't learn who actually rode the horse. Or did you? Not exactly. You do know, then. No, Penny denied soberly. I noticed something about the rider that made me think, but then I'd better not say it. Please go on. No, I have no proof. It would only be a guess. I think you're mean to keep me in the dark, Louise pouted. Maybe I'll tell you my theory later, Penny replied, opening the newspaper. Just now, I'm not in the mood. Both girls had been strangely depressed by their last few hours in the valley. Mrs. Lear had refused to come with them or to seek refuge in the hills. Gleeful at her victory over Mrs. Burmaster, she had seemed insensible to danger. "'Look at this headline,' Penny said, indicating the black type of the newspaper. "'Flood menaces Red Valley!' Quickly, the girls scanned the story. The account mentioned no facts new to them. It merely repeated that residents of the valley were alarmed by heavy upstate rains, which had raised Lake Huntley to a dangerous height behind the dam. "'Wonder if Salt got any good pictures when he was here yesterday,' Penny mused. "'Probably not. This is the sort of news story that doesn't amount to much unless the big calamity falls.' "'You don't think the dam actually will give way?' Louise asked anxiously. "'How should I know? Even the experts can't agree.' At any rate, we're leaving here, and I'm glad. 
Somehow, I've had an uneasy feeling ever since last night. Penny nodded and glanced from the car window again. Rain kept splashing fiercely against the thick pane, half obscuring the distant hills. Along the right-of-way, muddy water ran in deep torrents washing fence and hedgerow. As the train snailed along toward Delta, there was increasing evidence of flood damage. A row of shacks near the railroad tracks was half submerged. Along the creek beds, giant trees bowed their branches to the swirling water. Many landmarks were completely blotted out. We're coming into Delta now, Penny presently observed. Perhaps if we watch sharp, we'll see Joe Quigley and can say goodbye. The train stopped with a jerk while they were still some distance from the station. Then it pulled to a siding, and there it waited. After ten minutes, Penny sauntered through the train, thinking that if she could find an open door, she might just as well get out and walk to the depot. Stopping a porter who was passing through the car, she asked him the cause of the delay. "'We's just waiting for orders,' the colored man answered. "'Anyhow, that's what the captain says.' "'The captain? The conductor of this here train.' "'Oh, and what does he say about the high water?' He says the tracks between here and Hobostein's a foot under. Then that means the river must be coming up fast. Any danger that we'll be stranded at Delta? You better talk to the conductor, the porter said, jerking his head toward a fat, bespectacled train man who had just swung aboard the coach. That's Mr. Johnson. Penny stopped the conductor to ask him what the chances were of getting through the flooded area. Doesn't look so good, he rumbled. The rails are under at mile post 792 and 825. Then we're tied up here. No, we're going as far as we can. The dispatcher's sending a work train on ahead to feel out the track. But we'd be lucky to make ten miles an hour. Penny chatted with the conductor for a few minutes, then ambled back to the coach where she had left Louise. The prospects were most discouraging. At best, it would be late afternoon before they could hope to reach Riverview. I'm starving, too, Louise said. I suppose there's no diner on this train. As a stopgap, the girls hailed a passing vendor and bought candy bars. Having thus satisfied their hunger, they tried to read magazines. Presently, the car started with a jerk. However, instead of proceeding toward the station, it backed into the railroad yard. Now what? Penny demanded impatiently. Aren't we ever going to start? The porter hastened through the car, his manner noticeably nervous and tense. He paid no heed to a woman passenger who sought to detain him. Something's wrong, Penny said with conviction. A washout, do you think? It might be. Let's see what we can learn. With a vague feeling of foreboding they could not have explained, the girls arose and followed the porter. Something was amiss. They were certain of it. Losing sight of the colored man, they kept on until they reached the rear platform. Penny started to open the screen door. Just then, the train whistle sounded, a shrill, unending blast. Startled, Louise gripped her chum's hand, listening tensely. In the car behind, they heard the conductor's husky voice. He was shouting, Run! Run for your lives! Take to the hills! Penny was stunned for an instant. Then, seizing Louise's arm, she pulled her out onto the train platform. At first glance, nothing appeared wrong. The tracks were well above the river level. Between the roadbed and a high hill on the left, flood water was running like a mill race, but the ditch was narrow and represented no immediate danger. Listen! Penny cried. From far away there came a deep, rumbling roar, not unlike the sound of distant thunder. Leaning far over the train platform railing, Penny gazed up the tracks. The sight which met her eyes left her momentarily paralyzed. Down the valley charged a great wall of water, taking everything before it. Trees had been mowed down. Crushed houses were being carried along like children's blocks. Far up the track, a switch engine was lifted bodily from the rails and hurled backwards. Penny waited to see no more. The dam's giving away, she shouted. Quick, Louise, climb over the railing and run for your life. 
End of Chapter 18 Chapter 19 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Wirt Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 19 Tragedy. Leaping over the platform railing, Penny held up her arms to assist Louise. Now awakened to the danger, her chum scrambled wildly after her, only to stop aghast as she beheld the gigantic wall of water rushing toward them. "'Jump the ditch and make for the hill!' Penny ordered tersely. "'Be quick!' Passengers were pouring from the other cars, their terrified cries drowned by the grinding roar of the onrushing torrent. The wall of water moved with incredible speed. It tore into the railroad yard, shattering a tool house and a coal dock. On it roared, sweeping a row of empty boxcars into its maw. Spurred by the sight, Penny and Louise tried to leap the ditch. They fell short and both plunged into the roiling water up to their armpits. Penny's feet anchored solidly. With a gigantic shove, she helped Louise to safety. By swimming with the current, she then reached shore a few yards farther down the railroad right-of-way. Run! she shouted to the bewildered, bedraggled Louise. Up the hill! Scrambling over the muddy edge of the ditch, she raced after her chum for higher ground. Just then, the wall of water swept into the siding. As the train was struck, it seemed to shudder from the terrific impact, then slowly settled onto its side. Horrible, Louise shuddered. Some of the passengers must have been trapped in there. Most of them escaped, Penny gasped. There goes the water tower. A building borne by the flood rammed into the ironwork of the big dripping tower. It crumpled, falling with a great shuddering splash. With the backwash of the flood sloshing against their knees, the girls raced for high ground. Reaching a point midway up the hill where other passengers had paused, they turned to glance below. Yellow, angry water, rising easily ten feet, flowed over the railroad right-of-way. With unbelievable speed, the flood rolled on. In one angry gulp, it reached the long freight train farther down the track. The caboose and a string of coal cars were lifted and hurled. Strangely, the coal tender and engine, which had been detached, remained on the rails. Oh, look! Louise gasped in horror. The engineer is trapped in the cab! The train man, plainly visible, valiantly kept the engine whistle blowing. Higher and higher rose the water. Penny and Louise were certain the courageous man must meet his doom. But the crest of the flood already had swept on down the valley, and in a moment, the waters about the engine remained at a standstill. So quickly had disaster struck that the girls could not immediately comprehend the extent of the tragedy. From their own train, nearly all of the passengers had escaped, but the town of Delta had not fared so well. Apparently, the flood had roared through the low section, taking all before it. Farther up the valley, directly below Huntley Lake, where the gorge was narrow, damage to life and property might be even greater. "'What chance could poor Mrs. Lear have had?' Louise said brokenly. "'Or the Burmasters?' "'There's a possibility they took to the hills in time.' "'I doubt it,' Louise said grimly. "'The floodwaters came so quickly.' Already the yellow muddy waters were carrying evidence of their work. Houses, many with men and women clinging desperately to the rooftops, floated past. Other helpless victims clung to logs, orange crates, and chicken coops. At terrific speed, they sailed past the base of the hillside. Several people shouted piteously for help. We must do something to save those people, Penny cried desperately. What? Louise asked. By this time, the hillside was dotted with people who had saved themselves. Several of the women were weeping hysterically. Another had fainted. For the most part, everyone just stared almost stupidly at the endless stream of debris which was swept down the valley. No one knew how to aid the agonized victims who clung to whatever their fingers could clutch. On one rooftop, Penny counted six persons. 
The sight drove her to action. If only we had a rope, she cried, and broke off as her eyes roved up the hillside. Two hundred yards away stood a farmhouse. I'll see if I can get one there, she cried, darting away. The hill was steep, the ground soft. Penny's wet clothing impeded her. She tripped over a stone and fell, but scrambled up and ran on. Finally, quite out of breath, she reached the farmhouse. A woman with two small children clinging to her dress met the girl in the yard. Ain't it awful, she murmured brokenly. My husband's working down at the Brandale Works. Did the flood strike there? It must have spread through all of Delta, Penny answered. This disaster's going to be frightful unless we can get help quickly. Do you have a telephone? Yes, but it's dead. The wire runs into Delta. Penny had been afraid of that. She doubted that a single telephone pole had been left standing in the town, nor was it likely that the other valley cities had phone service. Do you have a rope? she asked. A long one? In the barn. I'll get it. The woman came back in a moment, a coil of rope over her arm. Send some of those poor folks up here, she urged as Penny started away with the rope. I'll put on a wash boiler a coffee and take care of as many as I can. Half sliding, Penny descended the steep hillside. During her absence, two persons had been rescued from the water by means of an improvised lasso made from torn strips of clothing. Others were drifting past, too far away to be reached. A woman and a child floated past, clinging to a log. Penny stood ready, the rope coiled neatly at her feet. She took careful aim, knowing that if she missed, she would have no second chance. Penny hurled the rope and it ran free, falling just ahead of the helpless pair. The half-drowned mother reached with one hand and seized it before it sank beneath the surface. Hold on! Penny shouted. Don't let go! Several men ran to help her. By working together, they were able to pull the woman and her child to safety. Abandoning the rope to skilled hands, Penny rounded the hill to a point providing a clear view of the flooded railroad yard. The roundhouse, the coal chutes, and the signal tower were gone, but her heart leaped to see that the station was still standing. Built on high ground, it was surrounded with water, which did not appear to be too deep. Penny turned to Louise, who had followed her. Just then, they both heard someone shout that the railroad bridge was being swept away. They saw the massive steel structure swing slowly from its stone foundation. One side held firm, which immediately set up great swirling currents. Any persons carried that way would be faced with destruction in the whirling pools of water. It's too late to warm the towns directly below Delta, Penny gasped. But there may still be time to get a message through to Hobostein. In any case, we must get help here. But how? Louise asked hopelessly. Any wires that were left standing must have been torn away when the bridge went. Penny gazed again toward the Delta Depot. Between it and the hillside ran a fast-moving stretch of water, as yet separated from the main body of the racing flood. If only I could get over to the station, I might somehow send a message. Don't be crazy. You haven't a chance to cross that stretch of water. I think I could. I am a pretty fair swimmer. But the current is so swift. There is a certain amount of risk. Penny admitted soberly. But we can't stand here and wait. Someone must do something to bring help. Don't do it, Penny, Louise pleaded. Please. Penny hesitated, but only for an instant. She understood perfectly that if she misjudged the strength of the current, it would sweep her down, perhaps carry her along into the main body of water. And once in the grip of that angry torrent, no one could hope to battle against it. The risk, however, was one she felt she must take. Struggling free from Louise's clinging hands, she kicked off her shoes and tucked up her skirt. Then she plunged into the swirling water. End of chapter 19。Chapter 20 of Hoofbeats on the Turnpike by Mildred A. Worth Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Cheryl Adam, Skowhegan, Maine, 2016. Chapter 20. Emergency Call. 
The current was much swifter than Penny had anticipated. It tugged viciously at her feet, giving her no opportunity to inch her way along the ditch. A dozen steps and she was beyond her depth, fighting desperately to keep from being swept with the current. Although a strong swimmer, Penny found herself no match for the wild torrent. Only by going with it could she keep her head above water. To attempt to swim against it was impossible. Despairingly, she saw that she would miss the railroad station by many yards. I'll be swept into the main body of the flood, she thought in panic. I shouldn't have attempted it. Too late, she tried to turn back toward the hillside. The swift current held her relentlessly. Struggling against it, her head went under. She choked as she breathed water, then fought her way to the surface again. The current carried her on. After that first moment of panic, Penny did not waste her strength uselessly. Allowing the flood to carry her along, she took only a few strokes, swimming just enough to keep from being pulled beneath the surface. As calmly as she could, she appraised the situation. The station was now very close. Scarcely fifty yards separated her from it, but she knew her physical powers. Her strength was no match for that racing, swirling, debris-studded current. She could not hope to span the distance, short as it was. Penny despaired. And then her heart leaped with new hope. Directly ahead, a foot and a half above the water's murky surface, rose a steel rod with red and green signal targets. She recognized the object as a switch stand, used by trainmen to open and close the passing track switch. If I could reach that steel rod, I could hold on, she thought. But do I have the strength? The swift current swept Penny on toward the upright rod. She took three, four powerful strokes and reached frantically for the standard. Her fingers closed around the metal. The swift flowing water whipped her violently, but she held fast. Drawing herself close to the rod, she shoved her feet downward. Still, she could find no bottom. Hopefully, Penny glanced toward the station, now less than twenty-five yards away. Although water completely surrounded the squat little building, it had not risen to the window level. Yet there was no sign of anyone near the place, no one to help her. Still clinging to the rod, she groped again with her bare feet. This time she located a steel rail. By standing on it, she raised herself a few inches and found firm footing. Suddenly an idea came to her. If I shove off hard from this rail, maybe I can get enough momentum to carry me through the current. But if I fail... Penny decided not to think about that. Releasing her hold on the rod, she pushed off with all her strength and began to swim. Digging her face into the water, she held her breath and put everything she had into each stroke. Pull, pull, pull. She had to keep on. Her breath was nearly gone. Strength fast was deserting her. Yet to turn her head and gulp air might spell defeat when victory was near. She could feel the torrent swinging her downstream. She made a final desperate spurt. I can't make it, she thought. I can't. Yet she struggled on. Then suddenly her churning feet struck a solid object. It was the brick platform of the station. Raising her head, she saw the building loom up in front of her. The current no longer tugged at her body. She had reached quiet water. Penny stood still a moment, regaining her breath. Then she waded to the front door of the station. It could not be opened. Penny pounded and shouted, but her cries went unanswered. The place is deserted, she thought with a sinking heart. Joe Quigley must have taken to the hills when the flood came. Slowly, Penny waded around the building, unwilling to acknowledge failure. Somehow, she had to get word of the disaster through to the outside world. Yet, even if she did get inside the station, she was far from certain it would do any good. Telephone wires undoubtedly were down. Penny made a complete circuit of the depot without seeing anyone. Sick with disappointment, she paused beside the glass-enclosed bay of the ticket office and peered inside. She could see no one, but as she pressed her face against the pane of glass, she thought she heard the chatter of a telegraph instrument.
That means there must still be a wire connection, she thought hopefully. Nearby, the flood had lodged a small board against the depot wall. Seizing it, Penny smashed the lower pane of glass with one well-aimed blow. She scrambled through the opening, crawled over the operator's table, and dropped to the floor. The little ticket office was deserted, although Joe Quigley's hat still lay on the counter. If only I knew how to telegraph, Penny despaired, hearing the chatter of the instrument. Just knowing Morse code won't help me much. The telegraph sounder was signaling the station call for Delta. D-A, D-A, D-A. Over and over it was repeated. Penny hesitated and then went to the instrument. She opened the key and answered with the station call, D-A. Where have you been for the past 20 minutes? The train dispatcher sent angrily at top speed. What's happened to number 17? Penny got only part of the message and guessed at the rest. Nervously, at very slow speed, she tapped out in Morse code that the train had been washed off the track. The dispatcher's next message came very slowly, disclosing that he knew from Penny's style of sending that he was talking to an amateur telegrapher. "'Where's Joe Quigley?' he asked in code. "'Don't know,' Penny tapped again. "'Station's half under water. Can you send help?' Shoot me the facts straight, came the terse order. Penny described what had happened at Huntley Dam and told how the railroad bridge had washed out. In return, the dispatcher assured her that a relief crew would be sent out without delay. Stay on the job until relieved, was his final order. Weak with excitement, Penny leaned back in her chair. Help actually was on the way. The dispatcher would notify the proper authorities and set in motion the wheels of various relief organizations. For the moment, she had done all she could. She listened tensely as the dispatcher's crisp call flashed over the wire. He was notifying stations farther up the line to hold all trains running into the valley. Repeatedly, Penny heard the call, W.F., which she took to be Witch Falls. It went unanswered. Half sick with dread, she waited, hoping for a response. It was likely, almost a certainty, that the station had been swept away, for that town would have been squarely in the path of the flood. What had happened to old Mrs. Lear and the Burmasters? Penny tried not to think about it. Unexpectedly, the outside office door opened. Joe Quigley, bedraggled and haggard, one arm hanging limp at his side, splashed toward the desk. Seeing Penny, he stopped short, yet seemed too dazed to question the girl's presence in the inner office. It's awful, he mumbled. I was on the station platform when I saw that wall of water coming. I tried to warn the men in the roundhouse, but before I could cross the tracks, it was too late. One terrific crash in the roundhouse disappeared. You're hurt, Penny cried as the agent reeled against the wall. Your arm is crushed. How did it happen? I don't know, Joe admitted, sinking into a chair the girl offered. I was knocked off my feet. Came to, lying in a pile of boards that had snagged against a tree trunk. He stared at Penny as if really seeing her for the first time. Say... He demanded, how did you get in here? I smashed the window. It was the only way. The agent got to his feet, staggering toward the telegraph desk. I got to send a message, he said jerkily. Number 30's due at Rodney in 20 minutes. All the trains have been stopped by the dispatcher, Penny reassured him, and explained how she had sent out the call for help. Joe Quigley slumped back in the chair. If you can telegraph... Let the dispatcher know I'm on the job again. This hand of mine's not so hot for sending. Penny obediently sent the stumbling message, but as she completed it, the telegraph sounder became lifeless. Although she could still manipulate the key, the signals had faded completely. Now what? she cried, bewildered. The wire's dead, Quigley exclaimed. Anxiously, he glanced toward the storage batteries, fearing that water had damped them out. However, the boxes were high above the floor and still dry. What can be wrong? Penny asked the operator. 
Anything can happen in a mess like this. Reaching across the table with his good hand, Quigley tested the wire by opening and closing the lifeless telegraph key. It's completely out, he declared with finality. Isn't there anything we can do? Quigley got to his feet. There's just one chance. The wire may have grounded when the bridge was swept away, and then if it tore loose again, we'd be out of service. In that case, we're up against it. Maybe not, Quigley replied. He splashed across the room to the switchboard. If there should happen to be the trouble, we can ground it here. He inserted a plug in the ground plate of the switchboard. Immediately, the sounder came to life, closing with a sharp click. I call that luck, grinned Quigley. Now, let's try that dispatcher. Want to get him on the wire for me? Penny nodded and sat down at the desk again. Insistently, she sent out the call. D.S. 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 All the while, as she kept the key moving, her thoughts raced ahead. She was afraid that persons had lost their lives in the flood. Property damage was beyond estimate. But catastrophe spelled big news, and she was certain her father would want every detail of the story for the Riverview Star. If only she could send word to him. What's the matter? Quigley asked, his voice impatient. Can she get an answer? Just then it came, a crisp I-D-S, which told the two listeners that the train dispatcher was once again on the wire. Quigley took over, explaining the break in service and giving the dispatcher such facts as he desired. Hovering at the agent's elbow, Penny asked him if the dispatcher would take an important personal message. For the Riverview Star, she added quickly. My father's newspaper. I doubt he'll do it, Quigley discouraged her. This one was needed for vital railroad messages, but we'll see. He tapped out a message and the reply came. It was sent so fast that Penny could not understand the code. Quigley translated it as, Okay, but make it brief. With no time to compose a carefully worded message, Penny reported the bare facts of the disaster. She addressed the message to her father and signed her own name. There, that's off, Quigley said, sagging back in his chair. Penny saw that the station agent was in no condition to carry on his work. You're in bad shape, she said anxiously. Let me bandage that smashed hand. It's nothing. I'll be okay. I'll find something to tie it up with, Penny insisted. In search of bandage material, she crossed the room to a wall closet. As she reached for the door handle, Quigley turned swiftly in his chair. No, not there, he exclaimed. But Penny had already opened the door. Her gaze fastened upon a white roll of cloth on the top shelf. She reached for it, and it came fluttering down into her hands, a loose garment fashioned somewhat like a cape with tiny slits cut for eyes. In an instant, she knew what it was. Slowly, she turned to face Joe Quigley. So it was you, Penny whispered accusingly, the headless horseman of Sleepy Hollow. End of chapter 20